whatever. So I came home from college. My parents were very good, like, come home, whatever you need. But if you're going to be here, you got to get a job. So I got this job down in Coconut Grove, which is sort of like the party area of Miami. Um, and I got this job at a, a, a kiosk that sold juggling balls. It was called More Balls Than Most. I got to wear a big t-shirt that said More Balls Than Most. I had that t-shirt till like three years ago, by the way, until my wife made me throw it out. It's a little ratty. And uh, I would teach juggling. I could always juggle. And then if people, you know, just to anybody on the street, I'm like, I can teach you to juggle in five minutes. We had a method. And I would, anybody could do it. And then they would be so excited that they would then buy our beautiful set of juggling balls for $32 and I would get a commission. Um, there were all these other people who had these kiosks. Um, and two of the kiosk guys were older than me. I cannot remember their names. They were not Roy and Frankie, but they were effectively Roy and Frankie. And they would run these little cons. And I, after we were done with work, I would watch them. I didn't really participate, but I was fascinated by them when they run these little cons. And that's actually how I learned about running the 20s, which is my favorite one of all of them. It's very simple. And um, it's an easy way to basically make 20 bucks. And I was just like, these people's lives are fascinating because they are low level con men. Like they are not ripping anybody off. They're not heisting. They're not making $3 million. You know, it's low level stuff. Um, and that's, that's really where it came from. It was like, I want to picture what these people are if they are 20 years down the road. Um, when it came to the angel of it all, you know, the, the daughter, I think that was somewhere, as I said, somewhere, you know, along the paper moon, I just liked the idea. I didn't, um, have a child at the time. In fact, I wrote it in the interregnum between uh, knowing my wife was pregnant and, um, her giving birth because I knew like once the kid Bailey, who's my oldest, who's 21 now came along, um, I was going to have very little time for a short, um, for a certain amount of time. So I was like, let me get this book out. Let me get it to my agent. Let me see if he can put it out into the world. And, and that's what happened. The fact that any movie happens at all is a small miracle. 50,000 things have to fall into place for anything to happen. And I've watched amazing scripts, not just mine, other people's scripts go on undone. I've think, watched things go up. The, the day I realized that you could not trust anything in this town so the, the movie Moneyball, which eventually got made, right, with Brad Pitt, whatever, was originally set to go, and it was Soderbergh directing, and it was Aaron Sorkin wrote it, and Brad Pitt was starring in it, and they got up to the day before the shoot, and it got shut down because of budget concerns. And I was like, oh, I see. It does not matter. Nothing matters. Like, every, there's seven people in town, whoever they are at any magical point who, who run the studios, and they're the only ones who matter. So... Um, Magic Man happened incredibly quickly. And I really the way it happened is I printed it out. I gave it to my agent. He happened to also represent, uh, he was an endeavor at the time and uh, represented uh, Ted Griffin. And Ted and Nick liked the book. He had a deal because of Ocean's Eleven because Ocean's had come out. And I think it even hadn't come out yet, but everybody knew it was going to do Gangbusters. And uh, they got it there, ended up getting it to Zemeckis, who then wasn't sure if he wanted to direct it, but definitely wanted to produce it. They got it to Ridley. And, and then it just happened. Um, it was stunning. I had done some stuff before because Rex, we had been turned into a pilot and we'd done some of that, but that was, that was my first experience. But this was the first time, obviously, that's something I had done that was suddenly big. And I, so my wife and I went to the first day of shooting, which was in um, North Hollywood or Burbank, I can't remember. And, um, and we get off the freeway and we're going up whatever the street is. And then we see kind of looming in the distance all of the vans and the trucks and a cherry picker. And, and I, I said to my wife, I was like, oh, I did not mean for all of this to happen. Like I apologize to everybody. And that was, my, and that's still my thought sometimes when, when we start shooting and I realize how big of a project this is just because I type some silly words onto a page. Um, so it was exciting. And, and so that first scene that I, that first day we shot um, Nick and Sam, they're like in the office and they're on the phones and they're just kind of doing, you know, one of their scams on, I think the old ladies. And um, it was amazing. And Ridley, I mean, I, I was a huge Ridley fan forever and ever, obviously as a sci-fi geek. Um, and I was a huge Nick Cage fan. I had actually, I had gone on this terrible game show once called Debt. It was Wink Martindale. And uh, at the end, you can have a, I never got to the end because I didn't get, I wasn't the last man standing, but had I, I had to submit um, a category that I felt comfortable in that they would ask me and I could bet my debt, I could double my money. My three categories, I had to give three. My three categories were uh, the music of Queen, big Queen fan, uh, the Godfather, because Godfather, and the works of Nicolas Cage. 
Um, and this is before Matchstick Men happened. So um, that was amazing to me. Uh, I was a huge fan and he was amazing in the film. I mean, he, he, he's, he's a, an amazing actor because the way my process tends to work is I have a lot of weird ideas every day in my brain and they get bounced around and every once in a while, you know, like a falling snow, something sticks to something else and then it stays in my brain and it goes and it goes and it goes. The only references I know I could definitely point to were I was a big fan of noir film, right? And, and as I as discussed, I'm you know big Elmer Leonard fan, and 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 Richard Stark and the Westlake books, and um, you know and all that. I liked Jurassic Park, as did everybody else. Um, and I, at that period in time, I lived across the street from the La Brea Tar Pits, um, and the original name for the book it's terrible, it's terrible, but I'll tell you, uh, was the Tar Pit Exodus. It's not a good name, but but uh, that's the only thing I can think of that there was some weird confluence of events. I've I've had stories in the past, and I remember when, when I first did press, I had to be like, I have to think of a good story, and I think I even told it on like the Today Show or something like that. So uh, I'll, I'll just come clean now. I do not remember, um, but it was some one of those ideas that that when I had it, it entertained me, it amused me enough, and uh, at some point I sat down and started writing. Um, and wrote it relatively quickly, the first, the first draft, of course, at least, and then stuck it in a drawer and did nothing with it for about a year and a half. Um, I had actually written it for, for my wife as like a Hanukkah present. Like it was like, I'm gonna try to finish this book so I can give her something. Um, and, and yeah, and, and I did. And then a friend of mine, like a year and a half later said, didn't you write a book? And I said, yeah, he's like, you should do something with that. And that's when I sort of went on the agent search and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he was always a dinosaur detective. It was always like the concept of, you know, it, I think it started as a Velociraptor and I went Velociraptor, VR, Vincent Rubio. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, and uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know why there are certain names that I'm just attracted to. They sound interesting to me and I go with them. And there are some that I end up reusing. I know we'll talk about Magic Man in a little bit, but, you know, Roy and Frankie have, have popped up in many, Frank in particular, I've had a Frank Mercer and now it's just a thing where I put him in on purpose um, in a bunch of different things. Um, and there's just something about the name that works for me. So yeah, that's how, that's how Vincent came to life. I remember very well where the title came from. So uh, it had this terrible title. And I had found uh, my agent, Barbara, and she uh, got it out there. And very quickly, Random House Villard had a, a book, I think, that had dropped out of the fall. They had a, a gap in their fall 99 publishing slate. It's like they're looking for something. And she got it to an editor named John Carp, who is now the publisher of Simon & Schuster. And John um, was an editor at Villard and Random House at the time. And, and he really loved the book. And he's like, we have to do something about this title. I was like, yes, we have to do something about this title. And so, you know, we brainstormed for a while. And then, you know, so remember this is 19, when this happened, it was 1998. And I had a fax machine. Ooh, I was very, I felt very adult because I had a fax machine. And uh, one day a fax came through from John. John Carp named the book. And it just said, big bold letters, anonymous Rex. And I just started cracking up. And I was like, well, that's, that's it. So I, it's not my title. That is not my title. Um, and then I went with it and did casual Rex and hot and sweaty. And then at that point, I'm like, well, I'm just on the pun train now. Um, <laughs> but it was John, who's a brilliant man. The book comes out, or yeah, I think it was even still in galleys. And we had a lot of interest and we had, so at one point, um, at one point, Robin Williams was attached to play Vincent. At one point, uh, George Clooney, which is, you know, before Clooney was even Batman, I think, was attached to play Vincent. Um, and the deals just never materialized. It didn't happen, right? And then um, we had set it up, I think, as a pilot at first, and it kind of had some tests, and it just didn't go. And then a guy named Mark Stern, who had been part of that, uh, ended up getting to run the Sci-Fi Channel. And he called me one day, and he said, guess where I am? And I said, where? He said, I'm running Sci-Fi Channel. I was like, oh. He said, you want to do Rex? And I was like, Yes, I do. Um, and, and that's really how it, how it came down. So I ended up doing the first adaptation, which was my first paid film gig. Um, and I, I, one of these days I'll find that script. Um, I am sure it was terrible. Um, you know, I can look back at my early screenwriting and, and know now as an experienced screenwriter, all of the mistakes that I was making. So, you know, went through a couple drafts, but pretty soon they said, you know, we're going to need somebody else to come in. And we're also going to need somebody to run the show, right? I was, I was 
there was no way I could be the showrunner. So they brought in another guy who was great, um, really nice guy, really smart sci-fi guy uh, named Joe. And um, he did, a, he did I think, what he needed to do to try to get the show made, which was made it sci-fi-ish, ended up losing a lot of the humor. Uh, he's still funny. Like, there's they're still the original script is still funny. Um, and then they hired a director. By the way, a fantastic director, a guy named Julian Gerald, who kills it on The Crown these days, right? You cannot knock anybody who's directing The Crown. Those shows are beautiful. But I don't, I don't know that he's funny. He had come off of some other big British TV show. And um, I think for whatever reason, it just missed the mark. And as a result, you have this concept, which is patently ridiculous, by the way, as we all know, um, taken, you have to take it seriously. You have to play it straight in order for it to play, but it played a little too much sci-fi channel. Um, and so it's fine. Meanwhile, you know, it had Sam Trammell, who's amazing. And I love Sam and Sam has gone on to do a lot of great stuff. Um, Daniel Baldwin, who, you know, did a good job as Ernie. Um, and and um, a woman named Stephanie Lemlin, who's still a close friend of mine, so I got to meet a close friend on him. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, was, it was a process, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot about having control and a lot about choosing the right creatives to bring your vision to life, um, which is something that over and over again, I continue to hone in on, continue to hone in on.